Good afternoon. My name is Laurel Youngquist, and I am a senior pre-medical student here at Calvin College, and I would like to welcome you all to the January series of 2017. I would also like to extend a special welcome to the guests at our three of our 50 remote webcast sites at Palos Heights, Illinois, Hastings, Michigan, and Prinsburg, Minnesota. And now, if you would all please pray with me. Lord, thank you for the story that you have written of restoration into this world and into each of our own stories as well. We admit that the process of restoration is difficult and sometimes painful, but we also ask that your hands and that your words would guide us as we dig into this process. Today, give us hearts and minds that are open and engaged to learn, and as each of us has a role in healthcare, whether it be as a physician or as a patient, a student or as a teacher, we ask that you give us your eyes to see where we might also join into your story of renewal. Amen. And now, Dr. Champion. Calvin College is committed to equip students to think deeply, to act justly, and to live wholeheartedly as Christ's agents of renewal in the world. Today's speaker has been pursuing the renewal of medicine. Dr. Nussbaum studied literature and religion at Swarthmore, earned a master's in theology from Duke Divinity School, completed medical school and psychiatry residency at the University of North Carolina, and the Faculty Scholars Program at the University of Chicago's Program of Medicine and Religion. He is the Chief Education Officer at Denver Health and Associate Professor at the University of Colorado's Department of Psychiatry. In addition, he authored the Pocket Guide to the DSM-5's Diagnostic Exam. In, an, in addition, he co-authored two more DSM-5 Pocket Guides, one to children and adolescent mental health and the other in elder mental health. Dr. Nussbaum authored a memoir of medical training and practice in an era of healthcare reform called The Finest Traditions of My Calling, One Physician's Search for the Renewal of Medicine. Following the presentation, he will be available um, to greet the audience in the West Lobby. Today, he will, be, he will describe why contemporary medicine, medical training, and practice need renewal. Calvin College is grateful to John and Mary Locks and Holland Holm for underwriting today's presentation. Please welcome Dr. Abraham Nussbaum. Thank you so much for joining me today. I was honored and privileged when I was invited to come for the January series, but I was convinced that there was probably a mistake because I am a lifelong Catholic, <laughs> right? And I wasn't sure you guys knew this because my name's Abraham Nussbaum and it can be confusing. And so I want you to know before we get too far into this that I'm a Catholic and I want you to see that there's some differences here. You see, last night I flew into Grand Rapids for the first time in my life. And if I hadn't have been there, I would have been here coaching basketball, right? I send my kids to Catholic school, and Catholic school is really like the Reformation never happened, okay? <laughs> it's like living in a medieval village. So when I coach Catholic basketball, we literally have people yelling from the stands, beat Christ the King. They're our arch rival. <laughs> Think about that theologically, right? My son thinks of his nemesis as Christ the King. That is a peculiar place to be, which is probably part of the point of being Protestant, right? You think Catholics need help. So are you sure, are you sure you want me here? Okay, you're willing. I appreciate it. Okay. So, like I said, if I wasn't here last night, I would be coaching basketball, right? And I want to talk about why that is. So what the record of my son's varsity team is one and four. Right? They're not doing too well. It's their first season playing varsity. They're all seventh grade boys, and none of them have caught a growth spurt. My son wants to play in the NBA. <laughs> this seems like an unlikely outcome. And I wanted to begin talking about basketball because I think it can illustrate some of what's at stake here. One reason for my son to play basketball is for an outcome, 
which is to be LeBron James, which would be an awesome outcome, but an unlikely one. Another is to earn money, right? You can play professional basketball even at a low level and make a tremendous amount of money. That is not why I coach him. And that's not why Catholics play basketball. So the other reason we play is for the pursuit of forming relationships, which build habits and have over a lifetime. So I want you to keep those three terms in mind, right? One is money, another is outcomes, and the third is relationship. But presumably you did not ask a one in four coach, right, of a seventh grade varsity basketball team in Denver, Colorado called the Blessed Sacrament Falcons to come out here to talk to you. So I'm gonna to talk to you about medicine, and I'd like to begin by having you all close your eyes. For each of you, as you have your eyes closed, I want you to think about what a hospital looks like, right? What it looks like, what's there, who's there. And in particular, I want you to think about what a patient is, what a hospital is, and what is medicine, what's a physician. Now, open your eyes, please. This is my neighborhood hospital. Does this look like at least what some of you thought a hospital looks like? This is not what the hospital looked like when I was a kid. The last time I went in there was 25 years ago. I went into this hospital, and I went in there because Steve Burnett did not follow the rules. And what I mean by that is that we had agreed to play football, and we'd agreed that the out-of-bound lines where the sidewalk was was out of bounds. Steve did not follow that rule and tackled me and broke this arm. And 25 years ago, I had to go into the emergency department and have it x-rayed. It was fractured. A physician saw me, he performed the x-ray himself, he casted my arm himself, and then he wrote out the bill himself and sent me on his way. <laughs> That's the last time I walked into Penrose Hospital, which is the community hospital next to my house, okay? The next time I went in there was actually last week. Over Christmas break, my father and my mother had us over to the house, and afterwards there was a ton of dishes. We're Catholic, so they had five kids and they've got a bunch of grandkids. We make a lot of dishes. So afterwards, he's got a big soapy bin of water and he's washing a glass and it breaks. And he lacerates the skin over the head of his fifth metacarpal on his right hand. He immediately applies pressure and it does not stop bleeding. So I, as his physician's son, get enlisted to take him to the hospital. And it's this hospital, Penrose Hospital. The difference is that today he did not see a physician his entire time that he went in there. He was treated by a team, right? And they asked him a series of questions that focused on demographics, on quality metrics, and on triaging his health. It was a very different experience. And what I want to talk to you today is about what's changed in medicine and why, and where it could potentially go. Okay, yesterday I spent two hours on the tarmac in United from lying from Denver. And I was struck again by this odd question of when each of you closed your eyes and thought about what a hospital was, how many of you thought that it was like an airport? None of you is qualified to be a healthcare reformer, right? <laughs> because healthcare reformers, and I'm not making this up, believe that hospitals should be like airports. And they say this over and over again. So they say it should be like this, like the airport I was in last night. Now, they have a point on some level, right? When you think about the comparison between hospitals and airports, both of them, the buildings are secured, the delays are unexplained, and you take your clothes off in front of strangers to prevent <laughs> attacks from invisible threats you can't see. But that's not what they mean, right? They believe that the way in which hospitals should be like airports is this, right? They say that your time should be regulated, that your speech should be scripted, right? So these correspondences are very intentional. The goal of healthcare reformers is for physicians and other healthcare professionals to work together the way that the members of a flight crew work, right? They want us to work in, like engineers do, in coordinated sequences using techniques like checklists, right? Has anybody ever seen this kind of checklist? So there was a time when we would say that a pilot, even the best pilot, would just fly the plane. Right? And there's an argument that comes up that even the best pilot would sometimes forget. She, he or she would forget to make sure that the, uh, that the wheel, the wheel chocks were in place, that the trim tabs were neutral. So now you come up with a list, a checklist. And the idea is that somebody follows this checklist before they fly the plane. 
When you think about this, it's important to think about what we're trusting. We're not trusting the person and his or her personal sense of responsibility. We're trusting the process they follow, right? This checklist. So, healthcare reform is really about this shift towards the checklist. Now, when people talk about healthcare reform, and of course we're talking about it again nationally and in Washington, D.C. today, people often think that healthcare reform is about the individual mandate that everyone have access, that would be required to have insurance, or they think it's about things like this, this question of who has access to care. And please understand me, those things are involved in healthcare reform and they're critical. I work at a safety net hospital, it's absolutely critical to us to have the Medicaid expansion. People also talk about the Health Care Reform Act as doing things like saying people with pre-existing conditions can continue to have health care, children up to the age of 26, which all of the young people in the room should be thrilled about, continue to have their health care insurance. But I believe that fundamentally, health care reform is about something more. And it can be hard to understand because people often show you pictures like this. And a picture like this is meant to discourage and demoralize you and prevents you from understanding what's really going on in healthcare, right? It looks like a wiring diagram. It's really hard to know if you want to file a complaint who to go to here, right? So, another way to think about it is much more simply, which is to ask yourself these things. What are these abstractions? What's a hospital, right? What's a physician? And what is a patient? So, as we go through some discussions today about healthcare reform, I want you to think about those three questions. So let's return to the first example. The last time I walked into Penrose Hospital as a patient, 25 years ago, right? I saw a physician, he diagnosed me with a radial fracture, which for those of you who aren't radiologists in the room is what's displayed here, right? He asked for my insurance card, he took care of everything himself. That physician, whether he would say it or not, was trained as an oslarian, okay? And being an Oslarian is the first model of healthcare that we're going to have to talk about today. Does anybody here know who Sir William Osler is? A couple of people. Are you physicians? Yes. So physicians tend to know who Sir William Osler is. Most other people do not. When you see pictures of Sir William Osler, he's often portrayed this way. As if there was... Uh, this is... If you look here, it says the saint, Johns Hopkins Hospital. This is from 1896. And the reason why is that Osler is portrayed as bringing American medicine out of the mire of quackery and up to the celestial heights of medicine as a form of science. Osler was revered. He's so revered that my med school, the coffee house was called the Osler Cafe. At the current hospital I work at, the conference room is called the Osler Conference Room, right? And for generations, we raised physicians on aphorisms written by Osler. Right? And I want you to think about these two here as we go through the talk. The first one is, he who studies medicine without books sails an uncharted sea, but he who studies medicine without patience does not go to sea at all. Isn't that lovely? There's a reason people read Osler's aphorisms. He, he made no significant scientific breakthroughs, right? But Osler was the son of a Protestant minister, and he maintained that rhythm and that cadence as a speaker, right? The second line here is the value of experience is not in seeing much, but in seeing wisely, right? Again, a beautiful aphorism by him. So, but what did Osler mean by these aphorisms? And how, why do I believe that he was so formative for experience for American physicians? This second line here, the Osler's was a dress that Osler gave to the army, graduating class of army surgeons in 1894. And I saw it and thought, maybe that's a solution to what's going on in medicine. So I went back and I looked at the actual essay in which this comes from. Has anybody ever read the essay? His address to the army surgeons? It's a reference to a very particular surgeon that Osler wanted to commend to these young graduating medical students. And it's a man named, um, well, we'll come back to it, I apologize. We're gonna to have to come back to it. But let me briefly explain why Osler was talking about army surgeons. The first is that Osler believed that if you were to be a physician who was a scientist, you had to perform dissections. Even though Osler was himself an internist, he performed over 1,000 dissections in his career. And he believed that dissecting the body was the first and most important thing a physician could do. 
So when I went to medical school, we spent four hours, three times a week for eight months dissecting a human body. It was my first patient, right? And I talked about that in the book, about the difference between my sister who went to nursing school, her first patient was a living patient for whom she made a bed. My first patient was a faceless, nameless cadaver whom I cut open until he looked like the book before me. Osler founded the first um, modern medical school, we say, Johns Hopkins, and his reform and his vision of medical education led to what's called the Flexner Report in 1910, which was the foundation for all of American medicine and its transformation in the 20th century. So, I mentioned that I was gonna talk about what Osler said at the end of his address to the army surgeon. And the reason why I wanted to talk about it today is because it happened in Michigan, right? Mackinac Island, somebody know that? <laughs> There's an army base on Mackinac Island, and in June 1822, there was a young, illiterate Canadian Native American, Native Indian, who had a gunshot wound to the stomach. And this young physician, this army physician, William Beaumont, was called to sew him up, right? And he was unable to stitch up the hole in this Indian, Alexis Bigadan St. Martin. So he looks at this failure of his own medical ability and he sees something most people won't see. He sees this hole that won't close. He sees an opportunity. What's the opportunity? Beaumont concludes that he can take this young man's fistula and use it to figure out digestion. So the army says, that's fine, you weren't able to cure the hole, you need to discharge the patient. Beaumont moves him into his home and he begins to put different kinds of foodstuffs into his, the open fistula and then see what happens. Over a period of several decades, he performs 238 experiments, right, which help us understand digestion. This is the man that Osler was referring to as the value of experience is not in seeing much, but in seeing wisely, right? So Beaumont eventually grew tired, I'm sorry, Alexis St. Martin eventually grew tired of Beaumont's ministrations and fled him several times, right? When Beaumont dies, Osler, who believed that an autopsy was the only way to truly know what was going on with the patient, right? Osler spent his, the end of his career trying to figure out ways to autopsy St. Martin. He would write his physician saying, when the Indian passes, please let me do the dissection. The family refused, and if you think this is just an example of using contemporary mores to criticize the past, I can tell you that they ultimately surrounded his body with guards and buried him under six feet of rock to prevent him from being dug up by physicians. So this model of the patient-physician relationship seems like an odd one to base American medicine on, but this is literally what we did. This is what we've done. In the Flexner Report, they wrote, of essential importance to the rounding out of the medical curriculum is the autopsy room, where the wise are brought to book. It's a lovely phrase, but look what happens in it. The idea is, is that the body is a kind of book. And I want you to think about that because we're gonna come back to it. So in this vision of the physician-patient relationship, there's a communication between the bedside and the laboratory. Right? And the result is that the body becomes a kind of text that can be read only by a physician. Right? If you think about it, the physician exercises the gift of Adam. He gives the name to each part of the body, tells you what it is and what it does. And as a result of that, becomes a kind of author of the body. It's interesting that Osler was somebody who really was such a good aphorist and such a medical humanities guy because this is one of his gifts to medicine, is he describes the hospital as a kind of library of amazing texts or cases that a senior physician is responsible for interpreting to a younger physician or student. When you think about the hospital this way, the physician becomes a kind of author, the patient is a text. And then what happens is the hospital becomes a kind of classroom in which senior physicians, because they're the most experienced readers, are the most valued people, and it's their job to interpret the body to a group of younger physicians and students. And as a result, you get the kind of world in which the hospital becomes very hierarchical, right? In which the hospital becomes a series of uh, hierarchies. And I'm gonna ask now, Laurel is gonna be kind enough to read the next slide to us. 
This is what happens when you think about the hospital that way. This is an address by Rufus Cole, who was the founder of the Rockefeller Institute and was an, uh, formed, trained by William Osler, and this is his advice in 1938 to a group of graduating medical students. During your intern days, the hospital should be your home, your workshop, and your playground. You should need nothing more. Learn to shun the outside affairs that will complicate your life and disturb concentration on your work. Rejoice if you are too poor to own an automobile to carry you from the straight road. Avoid the movies. You will find sufficient tra tragedy as well as comedy close at hand. And above all, avoid like a plague entangling affairs of the heart. <laughs> Let's thank Laurel for reading. I always wondered what was going on in the movies in 1938. It sounds really amazing that they were able to derail your medical career. But, but this was the vision that Osler granted to American medicine, right? The body is something that you understand by dissecting. It becomes a text that only a physician can read. The patient becomes a kind of subject who may even try to flee his physician, but from whom we can still learn, right? And the hospital becomes the physician's place. If you think about what the hospital was like in the 19th century versus the 20th century, in the 20th century, the, the hospital became the physician's place. In some ways, the physician was the host and the patient was the guest in this hospital. Now, I did not follow this advice very well, right? I married the first person I met in med school, <laughs> first day of orientation. So I had, I had gotten affairs of the heart and I apologize to my professors for that. But I want you to see that this model, the Osler-Flexner model, is often what's called fee-for-service. And critics, critics of healthcare reform often use a picture like this, and they describe this kind of physician as a kind of cowboy. I think it's an unfair caricature, but I show it to you because it's often what's used. And the idea is that this kind of physician, what we prioritize is experience, autonomy, and at its best, personal responsibility. But the criticism that healthcare reformers have used of this model of medicine is that it's often focused on somebody doing something for you or to you, irrespective of the outcomes he or she is able to achieve on your behalf. So this is the first model of medicine that we're gonna talk about. The second model is this. So I told you that I visited Penrose Hospital, my community hospital, 25 years apart. The first was with a fee-for-service medicine and Oslerian physician. The second was with my father, where we really saw a very different approach. I show you this because my father didn't want me to show his medical pictures, but his injury is right here, and it's a superficial laceration, which led to some uncontrolled bleeding, and he needed stitches. So when he goes to the hospital, he began to see a very different kind of hospital. They asked him triage questions initially, but after that, every single question that was asked of him was about demographics, metrics, or billings. He never saw a physician and only a team. When we left the hospital, I asked him to name any of the people he met. How many could he name? Zero. He'd seen nine people, and they had all interacted with him like this, and they'd done a good job. Right, they had sewed up his hand appropriately, it stopped bleeding, he's better a week from now, they'd given him a tetanus shot, they'd taken reasonably good care of him. But it was a very particular kind of care, and I was struck by the differences, right? Everybody he'd met had brought a laptop, and they looked into the computer rather than the patient's eyes. If the Oslerian model was to move between the bedside and the laboratory, or the bedside and the dissection chamber, Today's model is to move between the bedside and a series of data sets. If you look at the literature in the 20th century among medical journals, you will see that they're publishing the results of experiments. This is the result of Osler's vision of medicine. Physicians are supposed to be conducting experiments, just like Beaumont did. In the first half of the 20th century, most of the medical literature was full of individual case reports like the stories of Beaumont. Think of Sigmund Freud. His entire career is based on case studies of one or two patients. In the second half of the 20th century, we see the large randomized control trial where you're doing experiments on big people. In today's medical journals, there are very few experiments being run. Instead, what we're seeing are what physicians call prospective cohort studies, 
we're seeing these large data sets moving back and forth between the bedside and the data set. So the advice that we give now to graduating students in medical advice is count something, to learn to count something and then to figure out how to make it better. And when you learn about this way, this vision of the hospital comes from this idea that the hospital is a kind of ineffective factory, that the hospital's not good at performing routine tasks well, right? And so they say, look, what's the most efficient way to fix my father's lesion? What were those triage questions supposed to do? Those triage questions were supposed to determine whether or not he needed a hand surgeon or whether or not the physician's assistant could sew him up quickly, right? And those qu triage questions very quickly determined that he had no nerve damage and that he was not losing a major amount of blood. So they put him back in the pool and had the PA come up and sew him out. This is the benefit of a factory vision of medicine and of the hospital, right? I show you this picture because this was a picture that was shown to me about three years ago in the basement of our hospital, ironically, in the Osler classroom from a visiting healthcare reformer. Right? And he showed us and he said, look, do you see how they're moving a million cars through and they're doing so really safely? They haven't had an injury in 567 days. He had a point, right? That's a pretty interesting idea that they're doing a dangerous activity that requires coordinated care and they're doing it safely. And this is the vision, right? So you see that there's a whole push in healthcare to develop standard work, team-based care, and the priority is on efficiency. So you'll see things like Lean and Sigma-6 introduced into healthcare. But there's a really interesting question here. What is that a picture of? It's a car. And I was struck when I was listening to this guy that he was making an analogy to an inanimate object. And I was struck that most of my patients probably don't want me to perceive them as a car. And I certainly don't perceive myself as a car. And this is one of the things that I think is very odd about healthcare reform, is that the analogies are to inanimate objects. So in this vision of healthcare, we have to think about what has become of the body. I would argue that we've come to conceive of the body as an object, and in the result of it as a machine that is under the control of physicians in pursuit of health outcomes. Right? This is a picture that I love, it's by Fritz Kahn. Does anybody know Fritz Kahn? He's this brilliant early 20th century German physician illustrator. And he made all of these drawings in which the body is a literal factory. Right? And he did it without much sense of irony. And it worries me a great deal to think about the body as a factory which produces health. So this is what keeps me up at night. So people tend to think about healthcare reform as the mandate and the coverage but it's fundamentally about reorienting medicine to the pursuit of health outcomes. And the goal, healthcare reformers will tell you, is to measure everything we can, we use industrial techniques to improve it, and we assess the success of interventions only by the health outcomes they had. So as my father was leaving the hospital, his cell phone rang with a survey from the hospital. <laughs> right? And again, it didn't identify a person, there was no person you could respond to, but it asked him to rate all of these things and the experience, right? Now, there is a deep good in that. There's a value to an anonymous survey. There's a value to surveying every patient. There's a value to triaging people and to moving people efficiently and effectively through the hospital. But I would tell you that we are mistaken when we count healthcare reform as something that is a deep movement because both fee-for-service and value-based models have at least one thing in common, and it's that they believe that we manipulate our bodies for the control of medical care, right? Which is, I think, part of why we keep on comparing the body to inanimate objects. The other reason is, is that I believe that much of what we have learned in medicine in the last 200 years depends upon metaphors from two fields. The first is trauma surgery. And that's clearly what was going on with my father's injury. And in trauma surgery, there's an old saying that you heal with steel. That's what surgeons like to say. And the idea is that you've taken an otherwise healthy person, usually a young military man, he suffers a devastating injury, you take him to the operating room, and you heal him. The second metaphor that we tend to use for, emergency, for 
contemporary medicine is to think about infectious disease. And this is the idea that an otherwise healthy person suffers an acute injury, excuse me, an acute infection, takes a pill, and is better. And you see this metaphor and operative in all sorts of ways throughout medicine. So in my field, we use the language of antibiotics to describe antidepressants or antipsychotics, even though those medications don't have anywhere near the same kind of efficacy and response rate that something does that's an antibiotic, right? I would tell you that what we haven't reckoned with is that now, at least in developing worlds, medicine is no longer primarily about trauma surgery or infectious disease. It's much more about chronic illness. Now, chronic illness is something that most people don't think of with psychiatry. They think about a primary care doctor as the person who manages somebody with obesity, diabetes, or hypertension. But I would tell you that for most of us who practice psychiatry, it is the practice of chronic disease management. We help somebody with schizophrenia, but we do not believe that today we can cure schizophrenia. And I believe that there's some wisdom from psychiatry that I believe would help the rest of medicine and, I hope, society. And that is that in psychiatry, we believe that you heal people with forming relationships. What would that mean to look like? So a couple years ago, I read this book, which is a deeply obscure book by a Dutch feminist philosopher, right? I don't typically read a lot of Dutch feminist philosophy, <laughs> right? But this book caught my eye in a used bookstore. And what's amazing about this book is that this philosopher, pictured on the right, decided that she would go spend one year in a diabetes clinic. And she would listen to people, listen to the patients, the providers, the people in the system, and see what was going on. And she said that people spoke in two languages. One was this logic of care, and the other was the logic of choice. And she thought that they were competing logics. She said this first logic, the logic of choice, was a corrective to an old paternalistic vision of medicine, one where William Beaumont could keep a patient in his house, starve him, and feed him foodstuffs, right? That kind of paternalism. She says, we gave up that cliche, the doctor knows best, in favor of a different one. The customer is always right. She says that when we think of consumers as choosing medical services on a healthcare market, or as citizens entering into a contract with healthcare providers, we emphasize a person's ability to make a choice for his or her health. Emphasizing their choice appeals to our sense of what the world's about. And it allows us to think that the goal of healthcare reform is to increase efficiency and effectiveness through market-based reforms. But she observed that it didn't count for the realities of living with a diseased body. After all, who would choose unhealth? I told you my son wants to play in the NBA. He wishes that he had chosen a father who was 6'8 and had an unstoppable jump shot, right? He's stuck instead with a father who looks like this, who's 5'10 and a half on a good day, right? And is better at defending than actually playing. What she observed, what Anne-Marie Moll observes is that the only true predictable outcome of life is that we will all die. And she says, when we talk about health only in terms of choice, it distracts us from that reality. But she observed that there was a second logic operative in the clinic, which is this logic of care. And she says that it harked back to an old language where we understood people as patients. In this logic, an ill person is not constituted either by his or her choices, but how she engages with other people and with her own body while adapting to a life with illness. In this conception, the question becomes how to live with and within our bodies. The logic of choice promises mastery over the body, so what matters is an ill person is who masters the body and what outcomes are achieved. The logic of care is less concerned with outcomes because what matters is whether or not someone cares for you, the very process of care. So the logic of care requires practitioners to exhibit patience, mutual respect, and to take nothing for granted. And it requires a patient to admit her own frailty, vulnerability, and suffering, while tenaciously adapting to a life and illness which demands energy and determination. Anne-Marie Moll calls that ability to adapt to an ill body, to our changing bodies, tinkering. 
And she felt that that was the people who were most successful in the clinic, was the tinkerers, the people who worked within the system to try to change it or make it differently. I thought a lot about that idea. And I used it to map out this kind of graph for myself. That on one hand, you have this idea of the logic of choice. Ill people as consumers are citizens. We become the choices we make. We have mastery over the body. What matters is the outcomes we achieve. And so the goal then becomes for practitioners to follow the scripts to achieve the outcomes and for patients to receive the care he or she chose. The ethics of it is consequentialist because what matters is outcomes. And what matters then is policy that comes down from the top. That is healthcare reform on both sides of the political aisle. I believe that Anne-Marie Mall calls us back to a different way of thinking about things, where we think of ill people as patients who are made by the adaptations they do to their ill bodies. And what matters is then the process of care we follow. What you need out of practitioners then is not the ability to master the body, but to be patient and for patients to be able to tenaciously adapt to their body. In that language, you begin with a kind of philosophy that's a virtue ethics that focuses on the character of the people involved. And instead of doing top-down reform, you begin with tinkering. So I would call this healthcare reform, and I would call the second option a way to point towards the renewal of medicine. Like I said, it's a little bit like the basketball I should have been coaching last night. I would love all of my kids to become excellent basketball players. If they can make money playing basketball, I'd be thrilled. But the way that I read the literature about basketball players is that a lot of that depends upon winning the genetic lottery. Do you know how many NBA players have been drafted who do, whose wingspan is shorter than their height? One, right? If you're over seven feet tall in America today and, and a man between the ages of 20 and 40, you have a 25% chance of being in the NBA right now, <laughs> right? If you're my height, you have a one in 20 million chance, right? There's a lot more 5'10 guys playing guard than there are seven foot people in America. So my goal for these kids is not for them to become professional basketball players. My goal for them is to learn to be in shape, to learn how to play together, to learn how to deal with success and with failure, right? My job is to help them form the habits that I hope will help them over a lifetime and to adapt to who they are. Now, that's about basketball. In medical terms, what I'm talking about is a very fundamental distinction in the history of, of Western medicine. In a platonic vision of medicine, the goal of a physician was to identify exactly what disease a person had, what they were suffering from. The advance of Hippocratic medicine was the idea that the goal of a physician was to understand a person and to seek the forces that made them healthy and those that detracted from their health and work to rebalance those. So in some ways, all I'm doing is calling for a reclamation of the Hippocratic distinction, right? And it's because of that, that idea that instead of pursuing the disease of our patients, we would pursue understanding, that I borrowed the last line of the Hippocratic oath for the title of my book because I wanted people to seek renewal instead of the reform of healthcare. And I wanted people to see what it says here, that I may long experience the joy of healing those who seek my help. I think that's so different to think about the joy of healing over the outcomes. So in the book, I talked about some possibilities that, that spoke differently than the Oscillarian Flexner model and different than the value-based model. And I asked people, what if you compared the body not to an inanimate object, like a car or an airplane that was under the control of a physician, what if you compared the body to something that was more of an inanimate, an animate object? So what if you thought about the hospital as a garden? And in this chapter, I drew on Hildegard of Bingen and thought about this question about removing the obstacles to health, encouraging healing, and watching over time. I believe you guys had Victoria Sweet a couple years ago here, right? And so this chapter, this idea of the hospital as a garden owes a great deal to her. I also thought about what if the hospital was like a CrossFit box? Has anybody here ever done CrossFit? It's a couple of you guys. It's a much bigger thing in Colorado than in Michigan. Um, so a CrossFit box, in a CrossFit box, a coach works with you to develop new skills. I can, I, uh, yesterday morning, I did 30 pull-ups in a row. I couldn't do a pull-up 
four years ago when I started CrossFit. I couldn't do a pull-up when I was a teenager, right? I could do snatches. I could never do snatches before. And I was struck at the ways in which the CrossFit coach could, through coaching, teach me something. I know my CrossFit coach's name. It's not a team approach. They educate a whole group of people at the same time, but they do it through personal behavior, right? I wondered if we could think about the hospital more like a refuge, if we could think about them as asylums, places where we identify injustice. This model of the hospital owes a great deal to another former January speaker, Paul Farmer, and his idea that physicians should care for the indigent ill in particular, right? I also thought about this question of what if you thought about the hospital more like a poorhouse, and if you thought of physicians like servants, where the patient is the master, and the question becomes, how can I serve you? Putting others' needs first. One of the things I observe when I think about the hospital as a garden, as a CrossFit box, as an asylum, or as a poorhouse, is that they're all personal models where personal encounters occur. And that's why in the closing pages of my book, I included this quote that I'm gonna ask Laurel to read again. This is from the closing part of a book called The Movie Goer, which Walker Percy won the National Book Award for in 1961. Percy trained as a physician, but because he had gone through the Oslerian and Flexner model, to make extra money on the side, he moonlighted by dissecting corpses. Right, it all comes back to this. And while dissecting corpses, he contracted tuberculosis. Before they had a treatment for tuberculosis, he was sent to a sanitarium, a rest home. And while he did, he read a great deal of books and ultimately talked himself into a conversion to Catholicism. He also wrote a book, which is this one. And in the book, there's a character named Binks Balling. And he says this. There's only one thing I can do. Listen to people. See how they stick themselves into the world hand them along a ways in their dark journey and be handed along and for good and for selfish reasons. So, thank you, thank you, Laurel. So I think of this question, if, if we think about both people, both halves of a medical encounter as being together and encountering each other a little on the way in their dark journey. Now, this to me seems like the grounds for the renewal of medicine. If both the physician and the patient are recognized as travelers, people on their own journey. So that is why I wrote the book, is to think about somebody going out on a search for what it would mean to get the practice of medicine right. There's a joke in writing circles that there's two kinds of books, a stranger comes to town or a man goes out on a search, right? My book is a man goes out on a search, searching for the question of could we see patients again and what would it mean to practice the renewal of medicine? When I give this talk in other places, the talk usually ends roughly around here. Because I'm in Calvin, I'm allowed to go a little further and to tell you a little bit about my hero, who's the hero of the book. Does anybody know who Basil of Caesarea is? A couple of people. Okay, so Basil's my hero, and as a Catholic, we're kind of funny people because we have actual doctors of the church. And we name people doctors of the church because they are so good at combining both what, everything about faith at Basil's funeral mass, they talked about him as a symphony of faith and works. And the reason why was because Basil, as a young man, was extraordinarily well-educated. He was educated in Athens. He studied rhetoric and medicine, but decided that he wanted to go off into the desert and see the monks living there, some of whom were the desert fathers, and to see how they lived. He saw their life. He admired the work they did, but felt himself haunted by one question. And he asked himself, whose feet will I wash if I live alone? Which is a great question. So Basil decides to return to the city, okay? He comes back to the city and he combines the monastic tradition, the best parts of it, with the Episcopal tradition. And he becomes the leader of his city. He becomes the Bishop of Caesarea. And he gives these bracing homilies, bracing homilies to his congregation. And I wanna read one to you now. He says, the command is clear the hungry person is dying now. The naked person is freezing now. The person in debt is beaten now. And you want to wait until tomorrow? The bread in your cupboard belongs to the hungry person. The coat hanging unused in your closet belongs to the person who needs it. The shoes rotting in your closet belong to the person with no shoes. 
The money which you put in the bank belongs to the poor. You do wrong to everyone you could help, but fail to help. Basil would have been a really bad reality television star. <laughs> that is a really strong set of commandments. But what I love about Basil is that he built a system where people could live it out. He said, we are gonna build a hospital and we're gonna put it on the outskirts of town where two roads intersect so that it's available for the indigent ill, for the traveling stranger. And it became the very first public hospital in Western society. And it's why we have public hospitals in Western society, right? As a result of Basil's influence, now it has become common for every large city to say, we too should have a public hospital for the poor. That's one of Basil's gifts. But one of the things that's happened is, is that we've forgotten why we do these things. We think it's about the pursuit of health outcomes or the pursuit of scientific integrity and advance. This is an example. I work at Denver Health. It's a safety net hospital in downtown Denver. I am so proud and privileged to work there. But a couple years ago, the hospital put this bench in front of the hospital. And they put it there, it's a little garden for people to sit on, and they wrote on the side of it, right? Live, uh, l seek justice, love kindness, walk humbly. And what struck me is that they didn't write anything else other than that on the bench. They didn't include the rest of the talk. They didn't include any mention of the community that carried forward these words into the future. And I suspect all of you know that this is in fact from the book of Micah. If you don't include the rest of those words, I think that that bench, as lovely as it is, is an emblem of our forgetting about what medicine's about. Because if you go back and read the rest of Micah, what this passage comes from, there's a clear contrast. The prophet asks, what should I bring before the Lord? Should I bring burnt offerings? Should I bring fine oil? And the response is, you have been told, O oh mortal, what is good and what is required of you, only to do justice and to love goodness and to walk humbly. Healthcare reform is about switching from fee to service for outcome-based models. But renewal occurs only when we stop swapping or transacting, when medicine becomes not an example of us bringing our fine oil or our burnt offerings, but when medicine becomes an encounter between the well and the ill, especially the indigent ill. Now, Hippocrates sought understanding, right? And the reason why Basil could baptize Hippocratic medicine was because Basil understood that understanding was a prelude to seeing Christ in others. The question of Matthew 25. Because Basil understood that the hospital is finally not a place about outcomes. It's not even a place ultimately about health. It's not just a place for a physician to practice his or her profession. It's finally a place where we see Christ in the ill. Finally, the hospital is a place for us to live out Matthew 25. So, the, I mentioned to you that Basil is a doctor of the Catholic Church because he was both able to build institutions and because he was a fine theologian. Many of you know the rule of St. Benedict, which is built heavily on Basil's rule, and which includes this question, which asks the question of can a Christian make recourse to pagan medicine? To place the hope of one's health in the hands of the doctor is the act of an irrational animal. This, nevertheless, is what we observe, observe in the case of certain unhappy persons who do not hesitate to call their doctors their saviors. As we entrust them or the helm of, to the pilot in the art of the navigation, but implore God that we may never end our voyage unharmed by the perils of the sea, so also when reason allows, we call in the doctor, but we do not leave off hoping in God. Thank you, Laurel. So this is what I would leave you with, is Basil's question of what constitutes hope. Is the hospital finally a place to live out Matthew 25? And if it is, the physician becomes a kind of captain in whom we do not hope, but we trust, right? And then the patient becomes a crew member who has mutual responsibility for the journey that he or she travels with the patient on their dark journeys through medicine. I mentioned to you that Catholics are different. That's how I began the talk. And it is fashionable among Catholics to say that we need a new Benedict. 
I believe that in medicine, we need a new basil, somebody who was engaged with the world, but was bending it towards, however gradually, the gospel. Basil was able to take Hippocrates' work, which sought understanding of an ill person, and understood that it was the prelude, the beginning, towards what we could achieve in Matthew 25. He founded public hospitals as a way to achieve that vision. And so I believe that we must do the same. It is the eternal task. And I called this talk tinkering because I believe that you have to tinker with your daily practices. Many physicians are disheartened, but I believe that you can do some of these small things, these tinkering steps, in order to pursue the renewal of medicine. I thank you for the, your time and the opportunity to be with you. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, if you have a question that you've written out on a piece of paper and would like to have um, someone collect that, please hold that up and the ushers will bring them to the front. And um, I will get started with a question that was emailed um, by a student. Um, where do we begin to change the system to restore humanity to healthcare? Does it involve changing the way we recruit medical students? I think it, every step along the way, right? So I think you, under the Flexner model, you recruit students largely on their ability to master a series of science texts, which is one way. And I think there's a push within American medicine to say that's a good thing but it's not sufficient, and you could ask for a more humane approach, even from undergrads. Within healthcare, I think you have a chance in every encounter to make them more humane. So for example, with my residents, I'll observe to them that they'll often sit down with a patient without telling them their name, how long they're gonna talk, and I'll say to them, what would your life be like if somebody just said, didn't know your name and didn't tell you what to expect out of the encounter? So even that kind of humanizing stuff by saying, Here's my name, here's what you can expect to get out of this, here's how we're gonna work together. That's good information and just makes me realize I never told anybody who I was, so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll tell them, right, imagine what happens if somebody doesn't sit down. So my residents will sit down with somebody and five minutes in they'll be like, okay, I'm done. And the patient will be like, but I was just getting started. Yeah. But you didn't tell them that you're gonna only spend five minutes with them. Right. It makes a big difference if you set expectations with somebody, that's yeah. a way to tinker. Exactly. So we've got about eight minutes left, and I'm Rick Truer from the Advancement Division here at Calvin okay. College. <laughs> okay. Um, what are some small steps that we, as patients or as healthcare professionals, could realistically take toward a more person-centered medical care? Sure. So one thing is, if you don't have, if you have the luxury of having health insurance, you could make sure to have a primary care doctor right, who knows you, and if they don't get to know you, let them know that you're gonna seek different care if you have that capacity, right? Another thing that you can do is to choose to receive care where the poor receive care, right? It's one of the best ways to see how the system works, right? And, and I would just insist upon it. Every chance you can to insist upon patient-centered care. Yeah, choose. Question from someone in the audience here. What role does the hospital's chaplain play in your vision? Oh, it's a great question. I have uh, complicated feelings about chaplains. Um, I'm not sure I want to share them publicly. <laughs> I, I, well, now we all want to know. So. Uh, my, I'm a student of Stanley Harawas's, and Stanley, would, Stanley uh, believes that chaplains are a sign of failure mm -hmm. in certain respects, in the sense that the failure is, is that we've um, made that a separate task from the rest of medicine. And I share some of his concerns. I know deeply, profoundly good chaplains who can provide healing to people, but I worry about us saying that this is a separate kind of add-on rather than the core heart of what counts as medicine. Okay, so sort of a tie-in question that came in um, on Twitter. Um, do you see a role for churches um, to do this renewal of healthcare? Absolutely, right? So one of the things that you, no one asked is that the hospital in my neighborhood, Penrose Hospital that I began with, is a Catholic hospital. A hundred years ago, we would have been met and seen by nuns. Nothing like that happened in, during our encounter the last time we were there. So many of those religious, many of those institutions of health, particularly for the poor, were run by religious institutions in the past. Frankly, mostly by women. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we're suffering from today. So there's been a real push towards more technology within all of healthcare, and uh, this question from a student is asking, what's the role of technology within the paradigm shift that you'd like to see? 
Sure, I would tell you that technology is just a tool. It doesn't have a moral value. But tools shape you and you have to know their limits, what they're good for and what they're not good for. When to use them and when to put them down. There's a lot of benefit towards um, efficient and effective deliveries of healthcare. But there are clear limitations. So it tends to work pretty well for things like sewing up my father's laceration. It doesn't work nearly well as well with getting him to lose some weight, change his diet, right, and exercise. So it, I think it has to do with not falling in love with your tool, but using it when it's the right time to use it and knowing when it's time to use a person-centered tool instead. Okay, um, a question, another question from email here. Um, what is the role for um, effective hospital administrators in changing the healthcare system? It's profound. Hospital administrators have a huge impact. Um, oh my goodness, I, I, they provide so much support around what a hospital does. And one of the things I think that hospital ministers could begin to do is by being careful with their language, right? And so recognizing when people are customers, but when they are patients, and, and when people are providers, or when they are physicians, nurses, nurse assistants, all these different titles. Um, being clear about who people are begins with language. Hospital administrators set that. And so when they set goals for people that are focused on achieving these kinds of metrics that are often revenue-based, they then shouldn't be surprised when the employees at the hospital seek those things. So if an administrator sets person-centered goals, their physicians and other employees will be happier, and so will their patients. Great, so as, um, as we're all aware, there's a lot of chain or quest questions in the air about um, the Affordable Care Act and what's gonna happen with the new administration. Um, wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, the Affordable Care Act, and have you seen it affect your work, and if so, how? Sure, so we published a piece, I published a piece in the Washington Post two weeks ago, describing briefly that probably for me, the most powerful impact of the Affordable Care Act has been the expansion of Medicaid, which has literally changed my patients' lives. Um, when I started at the hospital I worked at, we would routinely discharge people to the streets uh, with a uh, prescription and a prayer, and now I can discharge them to many, many more services. Um, so I would tell you that Colorado has seen its, num its percentage of uninsured drop to very small amounts, and it has transformed our hospital um, and our practices. I've seen many people for whom the Medicaid expansion in particular has been critically helpful. Those of us who work at safety net hospitals are cautiously hopeful that Tom Price, the, the nominee for HHS, spent his career at a safety net hospital, and we're hoping that he'll remember that. Um, question here. What advice can you offer for um, students who are interested in going into the medical field? I say go. Um, there's big studies that show that most physicians are discouraged. Most practicing physicians would discourage a young person from practicing medicine. I think practicing medicine is an amazing thing. I'm with Paul Farmer. He says it's one of the few professions left that have a sliver of a chance for meaningful work. You have to fight for that sliver. Um, but it's, it's an amazing opportunity. It's a privilege to be a physician. And if you go to it understanding what the life is like and that you won't fully understand it till you get there, I would say go. Um, so we have time for about one more question here and then um, you will be available in the lobby sure. for afterwards for further questions. But um, following up on that, can you talk about um, what gives you hope for the future and, and some of the, I'll expound a little bit more on um, the benefits of practicing medicine. So uh, we're in a time of great change for our nation, and I think a lot of questions are up in the air. And I think that's an opportunity, right? Uh, I talked to you about how Beaumont looks into the fistula and sees an opportunity. I, too, look into this kind of crazy moment and see a little bit of an opportunity. And I hope that as we have a national discussion about what we owe to the ill and how we ought to do it, it gives us a chance. I think that medicine is about 10 years behind education, where many of these other things were introduced, these kind of standards-based movement, and you've started to see teachers tinker with that and try to make it better, and I hope that physicians will do the same in the coming years. Great. Well, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. You can follow me this way. Okay.